Yuma, and welcome to the Adventures of Russell the Camera series. In this episode, we're checking out Questacon. With a passion for teaching science to students and the public, Dr. Mike Gore, a physics lecturer from the ANU, was inspired to create Questacon after a visit to the San Francisco Exploratorium in 1975. Reflecting on his visit in 2015, he told the Canberra Times, Like many other people around the world, I stopped and said, wow, and came back to Australia and said, we've got to have one of those. Upon returning to Canberra, he set to work figuring out a way to develop an interactive science centre for Australia. By 1978, he was ready to apply for funding, receiving a $50,000 National Innovations Grant. Dr Gore spent the first half of 1980 securing the old Ainsley Infant School, which is now home to the Ainsley Art Centre. Where did you scrounge the gear? Oh, you name it, just about everywhere. Every organisation in Canberra, scientific organisation, helped to build things. All that was left to do was to come up with a name. Dr Gore's friend and colleague, Professor Chris Bryant, chose the word quest, meaning to seek or discover, and the Old English word con, means study or to examine. Together they embody the main mission of Questacon, which is to inspire a spark of discovery. Gore had the venue and the props. All they needed now were the explainers. In February 1980, he held a public meeting at the ANU to gauge interest in participating in the project. The great success of the explainers is they came from a very wide spectrum of the Canberra community. It's very important not only to show people scientific concepts and let them experiment for themselves, it, it's vitally important that they see how those particular concepts are used in everyday situations, and that's where the explainers come in. The ratio of visitors to explainers was 15 to 1, which allowed explainers to engage with guests in a casual manner and to maintain the exhibits. Two weeks before Questacon opened, a group of teachers were invited to check out the exhibits, most likely to generate interest within the educational community. The first students to attend were a group of 45 kids from Red Hill Primary School on the 18th of September 1980. To visit the Questacon, you had to book in advance, and more often than not, be a school group. Occasionally though, the Questacon would open to the public on weekends. Originally, visitors weren't charged an admission fee, but were requested to leave a donation. However, so many people were coming that a door charge had to be implemented. By 1982, the popularity had grown so much that Dr. Gore's dream of a National Science and Technology Centre was on the cards. The Australian Bicentennial Authority, or the ABA, created a task force to produce a list of recommended projects in the field of science. One of the recommendations was for the construction of a National Science and Technology Centre, inspired by the Questacon. In 1983, a specialist committee, of which Dr. Gore was a member, created a report investigating the feasibility of such a project. The report recommended that the new centre should be based in Canberra, thanks to the National Capital Development Commission, and also be truly national in character. To do this, it would develop travelling programs that would reach everyone from regional areas to the cities. In February 1984, the authority adopted the report and submitted a proposal to the Australian Government for approval. On the 24th of June 1985, the Minister for Science and Technology, Barry Jones, took the proposed plan to Cabinet where it was finally approved. What helped get the project out of the line was how it was funded. The authority offered to contribute $5 million and suggested that the Japanese private sector be invited to contribute to the cost of its construction as a bicentennial gift. In the end, the Japanese government and the Japanese private sector contributed $5 million each, 1 billion yen in total, or about $29 million in today's money. While the ABA and the government hashed things out, the Questacon hired a removalist truck, packed up 25 of its interactive displays, 10 science explainers from ANU, and travelled to Goulburn to set up shop in Burke Street Primary School. This was a trial to see if a travelling science circus would be worthwhile. The trial was a success, and the travelling science circus has been a fundamental part of Questacon ever since. A couple of months later, Shell, the fossil fuel giant, came on board to sponsor the circus. Shell continued to support the circus until 2022, when federal funding was granted to make up the shortfall once the partnership ended. By 2019, the Questacon Travelling Circus had done over 15,000 shows, reaching 2.5 million people and has trained more than 450 undergraduate students who now work around the globe. The circus was up and running, but a location for the National Science and Technology Centre had to be chosen. The National Capital Development Commission was tasked with finding a suitable site. There were four possible sites. Three were located in Civic, close to the ANU but the science lacked adaptability, displaced cars, or made the institution too local instead of national in character. The site that was chosen is where Questacon sits today. It was chosen as the first step in the development of a mall, which never came to be and is why the original entrance faces the National Gallery. 
It was also perceived as a chance to liven up the parliamentary zone and give it an urban presence. In order to start construction, both houses of parliament had to approve the site under the Parliamentary Act of 1974. The Act defined the parliamentary zone and the approval process for new work. With the site and funding in place, all that was left to do was to design the building. Lawrence Nilden Partners were hired by the NCDC to create a design brief, design the building and oversee construction. Lawrence Nilden Partners had a unique opportunity as science centres were often placed in existing buildings such as warehouses or ageing exhibition halls. Science centres also looked to the future. With that in mind, the concept they came up with became about cubes, cylinders and a never-ending ramp. Four cubes were placed in a space of six with a rotunda cylinder in the centre. Three of the cubes would house five galleries and the rotunda would direct the ramp and act as a central point for guests to orient themselves when moving between the galleries. Another benefit was that if a gallery was closed for whatever reason, guests could still move on freely without interruptions. The fourth cube would house the administration and the space between the cubes would hold the lifts, toilets, stairs and lounges. The foyer would become part of the public space of the parliamentary triangle, allowing the people to visit the restaurant and science shop without buying tickets. So I've been very lucky to get my hands onto the shovel that Bob Hawke used to turn the first sod of soil for the National Science and Technology Centre on the 30th of May 1986. It's a sturdy shovel and as you can see it's quite shiny and they keep it in their offices ready for any time that some very generous minister wants to give money to Questacon to expand. Earthworks started the very next day and construction was quick. The National Science and Technology Centre had to be built in time for the bicentennial celebrations in 1988. The construction of the centre was a masterclass in project management and adaptability. The final plans weren't even finished by the time construction began. Through consultations with the National Capital Development Commission and architects, the building's primary requirements such as mechanical and electrical services and their reinforced concrete structure were sorted out first, allowing construction to begin. The final details will be sorted out later. The building's basic structure is relatively simple. It is composed of reinforced concrete columns and slabs supported by drop beams and shear heads. Once the concrete structure was complete, the roof was installed. Made of mostly steel, the beams were designed to allow exhibits to be hung from them. Once once the roof was installed and the walls sheeted, work on the interior could begin. One of the biggest challenges for construction was figuring out how to affix the Italian tiles, as such a technique had never been implemented in Australia before. The tiles were attached to aluminium mullions with silicon and stainless steel hooks in case the silicon failed. The tiles were one of the first things ordered due to the expertise needed to install them and the long shipping times. As a cost-saving measure, the windows for the foyer were double glazed and shading was brought inside to reduce maintenance and exposure to the elements. The budget was so well controlled that if a part of the design would overrun the plan's cost allowances, the project manager, architects and other consultants would hold meetings to consider simplifying the design to achieve the same result for less cost. This was so successful that $400,000 was saved off the original plan. This meant the science shop and cafeteria could be built. By the time the freshly built National Science and Technology Center was ready, eight years after Questacon first opened, 800,000 people had visited the original in Braddon. In its first eight months, 365,132 people had visited the new building. Long periods of wet weather and a couple of industrial disputes meant that there were more than 20 weeks of work delays. However, the building was handed over only six days after the planned date on the 6th of July 1988. A 20-page list of defects were prepared, which might sound like a lot, but it's actually quite a small amount for a project of this size. All of the issues in the list were rectified within eight weeks. The National Science and Technology staff moved in on the 22nd of July to set up shop for a soft opening on the 10th of October. The National Science and Technology Centre was officially opened on the 23rd of November 1988 by Prime Minister Bob Hawke. As you know, this centre is all about hands-on scientific experience and it is now my pleasure in the hands-on spirit to declare open the National Science and Technology Centre. Guests from science, industry and politics explored the new centre while scientists from CSIRO protested outside for more funding. The entire event was televised live on ABC's Quantum. Today the building is still called the National Science and Technology Centre as the Science Minister Barry Jones felt the name Questacon was too childish for a national institution. Dr Mike Gore had the last laugh however, as Questacon is globally recognised as Australia's science centre. Today Questacon has a range of exhibits. 
When the new site first opened though, Mike and his team struggled to fill the exhibition spaces, but they made it work. In Gallery 1 on the top floor has the IBM Mathematica exhibition, which explored the impact of maths and simple computing principles. Today it houses Born or Built, our robotic future, which explores the line between mechanics and humans. In Gallery 2, animatronic dinosaurs were brought in from Japan, which by today's standards weren't very accurate. This exhibit wowed guests as the dinosaurs roared and looked around the room in an almost lifelike manner. Today, Gallery 2 is home to Fundamental, where classic science concepts are explored. This is where the harmonograph lives. Gallery 3, at the forces. Visitors would be pulled, pushed or twisted to learn about the forces that exist in our universe. Visitors could witness artificial lightning and experience an earthquake. Today is home to Awesome Earth. You can still witness lightning and feel an earthquake, but the earthquake house has been removed and the gallery focuses more on natural phenomena. Gallery 4 was used for the demonstration science shows. Today it functions pretty much the same, but is called the Q-Lab. To allow a single explainer to interact with multiple visitors, a donut bench was installed. The former director of Questcon came up with the idea after visiting the Horseshoe Pub in Glasgow. Gallery 5 was the Waves exhibition. It explored all kinds of waves, from sound, light and radio. Today it hosts The Shed, a hands-on engineering exhibit that allows visitors to play with engineering and design. For visitors below the age of 6, there is Mini Q in Gallery 6. Gallery 7 houses Excite at Q, home to the Freefall, Robotic Air Hockey and the Rototron. Today, the drum hosts the moon, but on opening night, it was just an extension of the foyer. In 2013, Questacon needed more space, so they opened the Questacon Technology Learning Center in the Mint's former admin building. It houses the science communication team, runs innovation workshops, and is where future exhibits are designed and built. Guests from all walks of life have visited Questacon. On a rainy day in 1981, Prince Charles visited, while explainers frantically mopped up all the water that was leaking through the roof. Not only British royalty, but Japanese royalty has visited too. Prince Naruhito visited in 2002 after a visit to the Australian War Memorial. You could say that visitors are destined for great things after they visit. Who knows? You might become king or queen one day. Sadly, Dr. Michael Gore passed away in January 2022, but his legacy lives on through Questacon, which inspires millions of Australians every year. I'd like to give a huge thank you to Graeme Durant and the staff of Questacon for assisting me with my research. If you have any memories, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, feel free to like, comment, and share. And if you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. The National Science and Technology Centre, Questacon, helping to shape Australia's future.